Ben, welcome to the Meat Mafia Podcast. Thanks for coming down from uh, Houston, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I just drove in, and boy, are my arms tired. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. A couple cups of coffee along the way. Yep. Dri- drive's not terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was easy. Uh, woke up. Uh, I, have four, I have four very young kids, six, four, three, and 20 months. And wow. um, last night was Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, were they know. overdosed on candy, or did you give them a little bit of steak before bed? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, yeah, they. Uh, we we do a pretty good job, like of not, of, moderation when it comes to sugar and, mm-hmm. like I mean we don't like we don't really have any processed food in our house, but we also don't don't want to be the weird parents that like don't let our kids do like normal things right like, yeah like trick-or-treating yeah um so um and uh so anyway they uh, we're, we're doing our best to teach them moderation on you can like you can have this and this and so last night you know they definitely had much more than they would normally get and uh, when i get home uh, when i get back home uh, tonight i'm gonna have a conversation with them um and i i'm gonna teach them about currency and I'm going to barter with them to take their candy away, but they can sell me their candy for like a trip to the Lego store or or something like that. I like so. that. So you guys aren't giving out beef sticks to trick or treaters? No, 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 no. Uh, they, you know, they like king size Snicker bars. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, we're so pumped to have you on, Ben. I came across Good Ranchers probably about a year ago. Somehow, your you guys popped up on my Instagram feed. And there was just so much good content that you guys were putting out. And so I started doing a little bit more digging and I'm like, all right, awesome. Meat delivery service, all U.S. farms, ships right to your front door. It's such an amazing service that you guys are offering. And I'm sure it's an incredible feeling to just really support these hardworking local ranchers and supply your customers with the most nutrient dense food available and the way that I understand it is, didn't don't you have a ministry background prior to starting Good Ranchers? I'd love to hear the origin story of what you guys are doing. Yeah, um, yeah. So I was uh, uh, I was a musician kind of growing up, and um, and uh, my grandfather was a pastor back in Louisiana, where I'm from, and several of my uncles and cousins are all in full time ministries. It's kind of like the family family thing. And so, um, so I was, I grew up very involved in church and going to church and, uh, and, uh, serving, um, the local church and, uh, moved to Houston when I was right after high school, moved to, uh, South Houston. And when I was 18 and, um, started, uh, found a church, got plugged in, started serving. And then, um, um, uh, with no intention of like working for the church, honestly. Yeah. And, um, but they wound up hiring me because they wanted me, um, they wanted more of my time mm. and I had a job. And so they asked me to come on staff. And so I said, sure. And did that for about five or six year, years there. And then a large church in Houston, like a mega church. Um, I'd been, I was actually doing like production stuff. And uh, so I went to school for audio engineering. Mm. That's quite, that's not really a, one of the reasons I was asking questions about the studio. And yeah. Like yeah. Brand, Cause so uh, I went to uh, school for audio engineering and, um, and uh, so I like to you know, write music, make music, produce music and stuff like that. And so that's what I was like, that was what I was doing. And then I got hired by a really large church in um, South Houston and was there for about seven or eight years. But about five years into it, I started, um, I, there was something inside of me that I didn't, I didn't like um, that all of my income was coming from tithe payers. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. um, no knock on the church, no knock, like working for a church is a, is a real job. Uh, uh, even, you know, I would work 40 to 60 hours a week, uh, um, you know, preparing for services, leading people, tr- uh, training volunteers and, and doing stuff like that. Um, so that's say, because rel- relentlessly, almost every Sunday, somebody would say, say to me, um, so what do you do? Like, what do you do all week? Yeah. Like, Cause they just think, they think you just show up and sing right. sing a song or two um <laughs> yeah so i um yeah i would full-time ministry thought that was my plan my path but there was something inside of me that i started you know praying and asking god like 
to to give me um this wasn't a, a word then but or a phrase then but it is now a side hustle mm. I was thinking like what could i do on the side to where all of my money doesn't have to come from the church yeah. um and uh and so i i started getting this idea of a meat company and mm. which is like the farthest thing like it doesn't make any sense yeah. like for, for me and my background and what I didn't know. Um, and, uh, but I kept, I started having this idea f- to start a meat company and, and, but it was, it was like the, the idea was there, but in my brain it was for someone else. And I remember mm. talking to my wife, like, you know, somebody should do this, 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 this. And, um, and so over the course of almost a year, every two or three months, I would start getting these ideas mm. and, um, and then finally, um, and I would kind of talk to my wife about it, but it was never me who was going to do the thing because yeah. like, I have no idea how to start a business. I have the money to start a business. I'm, I feel like I'm in my path and what I'm supposed to be doing. And then, uh, one morning I was getting ready and I started thinking about this meat company again. And I, as clear as day, I heard God's voice, um, uh, you know, say so it's funny. I clearly heard it in my head, but it was, it was loud and it was clear and it was resonating mm. and it was, you do it. And like, it was a sobering moment. Like, wow. cause I was, you know, I was thinking and cause in my head, again, it was always like somebody could do this, this, and this. And so I like had this resonating voice say, you go do it. And, um, came out of the bathroom. I told my wife, I think God just told me to start a meat company thinking she's going to go, that's crazy. You're, yeah. what do you know about agriculture? Where are we going to get the money to start a company? You've never ran a company, yeah. like, like all the things. And, um, but I think she could feel the conviction that I, that I said it with. Um, and, uh, and she just looked me in the eyes and said, if you heard God, then I trust you. Mm. And we had just had our first baby boy. Um, and that was in September of, of we had him in September of 2017. This was in December of 2017, going into 2018. So he was what two months old, three months old, and uh, um, in January, in January we made the decision. I quit my job at the church, filed for an LLC. Um, we wanted to name the company the the company the company the Jolly Ranchers, but mm. we figured we'd get in <laughs> yeah. trouble for that. So uh, we landed on Good Ranchers. Um, and uh, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, a great name. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, sitting around my my wife and I and, and and my best friend at the time, or still my best friend, but you know, yeah, you've evolved uh, six years ago. Yeah, um, we were sitting around the table, and I was just being funny, and I was like, I got it, the Jolly Ranchers. Yeah, right? and then, um, but then, uh, Good Ranchers came out of that, mm-hmm. and but even then, we had no idea that we would be that we would be supporting American farms, that we would be, you know, uh, like doing the good that we're doing in the industry. And mm-hmm. um, now we had no idea. That wasn't the plan back then. Like, I didn't know what the plan was. I just knew start a meat company. Mm. Um, and I really thought that, I honestly thought it was going to be like a means to an end. I thought that um, I'm going to start this meat company because I heard God say, go do it. But I thought it was going to, I was and I don't know why I thought this, but I thought, okay, I'll probably do this for a couple of years and then get back into full-time ministry. Yeah. Like, um, and then, so we started in 2018, didn't know anything about anything, um, about fast forward to 2019 in middle of 2019 is when we started learning about the cool law, started realizing that a lot of what we were buying through layers of middlemen were, uh, was actually coming from Mexico, was coming from South America, was coming like, and, and, and that's when I went, wait, what? Yeah. And, and, uh, started, um, asking questions and digging and, and, and realize, I mean, the meat industry, it's, you know, you guys, I don't know how familiar you are with the phrase meat mafia. Um, but, uh, it's, it's, it's a real term Mm -hmm. in the meat industry, like Mm -hmm. with the buyers, with the sellers, like, um, like 
there's there's a meat mafia out there because yeah. it's a uh, it's there's a lot of there's a lot that goes on under the table. There's a lot that goes on behind the curtain, um, and there's so much ambiguity um, uh, just involved, and and a lack of transparency. I mean, just a massive lack of transparency uh, on honestly probably the most important thing that people spend their money on because like you are what you eat, Mm -hmm. what you put into your body. Like it's, it's literally our fuel and that's like, it's what's going to help us age well and hopefully live longer. And you know how you treat your body and first and foremost, what you put in, in Mm it um, is massively important. And there's such a lack of transparency in the food in the food industry in general, but especially in, in the meat world. Um, so like that was like eye opening and in 20 going into 2020, um, we drew a line in the sand and said, and we were had some buying power by that time. And we were able to cut away the layers of middlemen and start get going directly to sources. And, um, and that's when we, uh, when, when we said, you know what, we're not going to sell anything that's imported. We want to support American farms and ranches. Um, and then beyond that, we also said, my wife and I, we made the, the, the choice, the, the decision. Um, you know, a lot of people start companies and, or run companies and they get focus groups and um, consultants and people to tell them what you should what you should do, what do people want? Who's your target audience? What do they like? Mm-hmm. And uh, for us, I think we were um, either too ignorant or, um, or too poor uh, <laughs> <laughs> to do it, but uh, to do any of that. But uh, it was really easy for us. We said, what do we want to eat? What do we want to bring into our home? Yeah. What are we going to serve to ourselves, to our kids, to our family um, and our friends? And, and that's really what we, that's what we said we're that's what we're going to source um and you know health and fitness has always been really important to me it's really important to my wife and but after we started having kids like it became even more important to start looking at labels and and understanding um those things and so yeah we we said you know what we're only gonna uh, good ranchers we're not gonna sell anything um that we wouldn't eat ourselves that we wouldn't bring into our home um, and uh, wouldn't feed to our family and our friends. Yeah. And it sounds, you know, it sounds funny, right? But yes. like <laughs> it, it's, it was, it was really simple. And when we did that and we made that switch, um, it, we just, you know, the growth really just, just started compounding and um, um, yeah, it's been a, been a wild ride it's been a and we're still going but i was doing the math this morning we've we've grown um from 2021 to today so over the last two years we've we've grown um what was it yeah it was 1400 percent like wow yeah that's amazing so yeah i know incredible yeah it's and it's and managing that growth is not easy um and, and we're, and we're completely bootstrapped. Like, wow. like we've never taken funding. We don't have investors. We don't, you know, there's no, there's no corporation behind it. It's still, it's, it's me and my wife and, um, a, a lot of family and friends came along and, and helped us. And, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're blessed to be doing what we're doing, but it's, uh, it, I, I I'm appreciative for you guys and what, um, what you're doing with the Meat Mafia podcast um, is telling the story because I say this, I, I go on quite a few podcasts and I say this all the time, but it's not actually true for you guys. But more people need to be telling the story of yeah. of what's happening in the food industry, and more people need to be talking about it and taking that serious um, because it, it's it's very important and it's only going to change if we make people aware Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's it's really special that as you learn more about the end the meat industry itself that you guys committed to this hey we're only going to support u.s farms that are doing things the right way and it sounds really noble 
but it's really tough from a business perspective, knowing that, hey, I'm trying to feed my wife, I'm trying to feed my kids. If I go overseas and import this stuff, it's gonna be way cheaper. Yep. So it's easy to say it's hard to do. And you touched on an amazing point with the COOL Act where 99.9% no, .9 of Americans have no idea where their meat is coming from. When I came across this, the fact that the COOL Act was repealed in 2015, so now you can, you can slap a label on and say it's a product of the USA, and all that means is that it's packaged in the US. Mm -hmm. So the animal can be raised, slaughtered, processed in Brazil, mm -hmm. shipped over here. You could slap a pasture raised USA label on it at Whole Foods mm -hmm. and you think you're eating local Texas beef. And it's like, no dude, that's coming all the way from Brazil. Yep. No, that's, that's exactly right. And um, yeah, the, the, I think we're making strides with the cool law mm -hmm. getting reinstated. Uh, you know, I'm, I have a pretty, I have a pretty, I have my ear to the ground um, in the industry of what's what's happening, and I, I think we're making strides because because people are becoming more and more aware of it. Mm -hmm. There was this, uh, a survey done earlier this year, um, and uh, uh, like the it was like ninety one percent of the people who took the survey said they would buy it, they would buy beef born, raised, and harvested in, in the U.S. Mm. versus import it if it was labeled. Wow. If it was labeled like 91% of the, of the people. So, um, yeah, I think we're making some strides to get there. And and I I, sh I really hope we get there soon because what what people don't think about, and we come up against this question or this, this uh, idea or comment, um, pretty regularly where people say, well, yeah, I don't really care where it comes from um, because they think, uh, and what they mean by that is I don't really care if it comes from Brazil or from Australia or from Canada or South America, Mexico, whatever, because I just want what tastes good and, mm. and, and, um, uh, and, and they want it inexpensive. Yeah. So, um, and, uh, usually that's what they mean by that. Like, oh, I don't care if it comes from somewhere else because it's, it's not, it's not like it's going to hurt me. Um, but it is hurting the American farmer. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's what you're not taking into account when you say, well, yeah, I mean, sure. It's there's, there's no nutritional difference between beef raised in the U S uh, or beef raised in Brazil. Like, um, cause last time I checked, there's, you know, there's still cows, right? Mm -hmm. or, um, and, um, but, um, but the difference is the American farmer, the American families that are working these farms, there's 700,000 independent um, uh, ranches, beef ranches in the U.S. today, about 700,000. And uh, the average, um, the average herd size um, is only about 50. Wow. Think about pretty that. Small. I, people have this idea that they think, you know, you, you watch Yellowstone and you, you, you think that these ranchers have tens of thousands of acres or in their case, hundreds of thousands of acres. And, mm -hmm. you know, just all of these cattle and these massive operations of the 700,000 independent ranches still, ex still in existence today. Um, uh, the average herd size is about 50. It's actually like 48 point. Mm something. And, uh, and, and that's what people don't realize. Like those are the ones that are hurting the big, you know, the, the, the big, the big guys, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're going to make it, but there's, there's families that have been farming for generations, ranching for generations. And, um, they, they absolutely need, like, they're not trying to make a bunch of money. They're like, it's their way of life. It's their, it's, it's a very simple way of life. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they'll, they, they'll raise 40 to 80 cattle depending on the, the herd size and the year and water mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and they just absolutely love it. It's their, yeah. and they need, um, they need to be able to get more money, um, for them at the auction when they, mm. when they go to sell them to, I mean, everybody has a different, but most of them, um, most of, of them just, uh, have to sell them to the auction mm -hmm. and they're going to take whatever they can get. It's a beef is a commodity. And, yeah. um, and the problem with that is when 
billions of pounds of beef are being imported and can be sold online by um, companies like ButcherBox. Yep. Uh, like, uh, remind me to say something about that in a second. But um, and and a host of others where people buy from these companies thinking that they're supporting local farms. And the reality is almost all of the beef they source is from overseas. It says mm -hmm. it right on their website. Yeah. But the people who are going to their website, they just you see an ad on Facebook or online and buy from small local farms. You just assume that's small local American farms because you're buying yes. here. Um, and it's just not the case. And that, so, so those ranchers that, that are working tirelessly, the other side of this, that the average consumer or just even like you said, 99.9% .9 of people, you know, cattle, like, you know, chickens have a six week lifespan from, mm -hmm. <laughs> from, uh, hatch to harvest. Like it's six weeks. It's quick. It's a fast turnaround. Cattle take years. Yeah. yeah. Like, and it's a brutal season for, um, for ranchers in Idaho and Utah and Colorado and like these, these areas that have hard winters mm. and they're birthing, they're, they're birthing calves through January and February and out in the snow and in the middle of the night, like, um, uh, and we're just disrespecting them um, by, by there being no difference between what they're doing and imported from across the world, um, grossly inferior, lower quality, but it can be sold in the grocery store right next to each other as the same exact thing. And mm. it's not. So, um, we got to speak up for ranchers. We got to speak up for farmers. There should, it, it, Plain as day, it should have to be labeled born, raised, and harvested or imported from Brazil, mm. imported from Australia, imported from Mexico, Canada, you name it. If it's not, um, it shouldn't be able to say product of USA, like you said. So, yes. um, yeah, Butcher Box just hit us with a cease and desist um, because we uh, because we regularly call them out for importing beef, which if you go to their website and you click sourcing. It's got this beautiful thing about, you know, farms and families and, and all this stuff. And then you click learn more yep. and then you click again and it's going to say, we source the majority quote, we source the majority of our beef from Australia. And then they go on to like, the thing, but people aren't doing that. Like people aren't, yeah. you know, following the click. So, um, anyway, we like to mess with them a little bit and, uh, <laughs> as you should, <laughs> Hook the bear. Yeah. 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 We did a, uh, a video on Instagram. Our, our team did where, uh, for Halloween that this woman goes to her door and looks down and there's like a butcher box box. And, and uh, and she's like, ah, yeah. you know, it's like so scared. And then she goes, Oh wait. And she picks it up and there's good ranchers underneath. She's like, Oh, okay. It's We're like, good. You know, it's just a costume. And that was our way of like, you know, that they're, um, with what they're doing with imported meat is, you know, um, it's a costume, right? So, uh, they did not like that at all. I'm sure they didn't. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned transparency before and it, you guys have both been hitting on it with the cool act and it seems like it can't really, um, if we want the American rancher to survive, it can't really continue along this trend. Would you agree with that sentiment? Like if for the next five, 10 years, we continue to have these laws, it's really going to hurt the, yeah. The American rancher. Yeah. I was, uh, in Idaho talking to, talking to, a, to, uh, one of our, one of our ranchers in, um, April of this year. And, and, um, he, he teared up and he said, and he was, he's probably in his seventies. And, uh, and he, he, he just, he said, it's getting so hard. Um, and his son is taking over the ranch and, and um, now and, and his grandkids, um, and he had tears in his eyes saying how hard it is for them and, and that he doesn't, he just doesn't, he doesn't see it really being a viable way of life very much longer. And, 
it was, I mean, it was gut wrenching. It was, yeah. it, it, it hurt. Like, I was like, Oh my gosh. Like, um, and, and that, that same family, um, he was telling me a story of the, of this past winter of how hard it was. And what I was saying is like the, the things that people don't think about. Um, and there was a night that, uh, three calves were born in the, in the middle of the night, they went out there by the time they got, got to them, um, like they, they were like frozen, like, you know, and for the afterbirth and like their eyes were frozen and their ears were like, like, like were just freezing. They pick them up. Um, I said three, I'm sorry. It was two They they, they pick them up and they bring them inside to their living room, put them in front of the fireplace and put blankets on them and thinking that, um, they thought they were, they thought they weren't going to make it through the night, but, um, and to wake up the next morning to two little calves running around their living room, like, like that's the, you know, that's the, the, the part of this that people don't even think about. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think the, the, um, like the vegan, the PETA, the anti-meat people, mm -hmm. uh, I think they did a really good job of completely dehumanizing what agriculture really is. Yeah. And, you know, which this idea of factory farming, which there is a such thing as factory farming. Um, so, um, um, but th they did a really good job of just putting in people's minds that, that everything is factory farming yes. and everything is bad and that there aren't people like, uh, the family that I just talked about that are actually, um, out in a field with these animals every single day and bringing them to their home and wrapping them with blankets to keep them alive mm. as, as calves through the night. Um, and the reason they do that is because that's their livelihood. Yes. They can't, they, they, you know, they can't afford to lose, um, any animals really. I mean, they, they, cause they have to, I mean, you know, you know, things happen, but they, they have to work and strive to, to keep them alive and to raise them well to raise them with low stress, like, uh, cause all of that plays into how much money they're going to be able to sell them for. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, the, again, the anti meat people did a really good job of just putting this blanket in everyone's mind that, um, if you're eating meat, you're eating factory farmed and just really dehumanizing the American rancher, the American farmer, and the the reality of what goes into the day to day, and that it's actually families' lives that that you're affecting. Um, you know, we do all this. When you think about PETA, they they um, you know their whole thing is the animal, the animal, the animal. Well, there's people behind these farms. There's people. There's families that like this is their way of life, and and um, you know I've never uh, I've actually never really said that out loud, um, uh, that way before, but, um, yeah, we, 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 we have to do a better job on the other side of bringing the humanity of farming, of agriculture, of ranching and the human side of that back to the people. Mm. Um, like what, so what does product of USA mean? What is born, raised and harvested in the U S mean versus, um, um, born, raised across the world, um, slaughtered and, uh, you know, broken up, uh, into primals and put on a barge and, mm. and shipped over here and then come through customs and imported and then just, and then, um, further processed in a USDA plant. Um, yeah, we, we need to talk about the human side, like the people that are behind, um, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Those words that you're saying are so important. And it's, I think a huge reason why our show exists, but really the only thing that I would advise someone is the only way to really get it and understand the people is to be intentional and find a rancher and shake their hand and build a relationship with them. You know, like to what you said, it's not going to come from a Netflix documentary. It's probably not even going to come from a podcast like this. You need to actually just go out there and you won't meet bigger animal lovers or environmentalists or people that care about the customer more than your local farmer and rancher. And I'm sure for you, it must make you feel amazing about your mission because you're offering them 
one of the most valuable resources ever, which is like distribution to customers that want to find them. Like you're, you're allowing them to scale and get their products across the country in a way that they would never be able to do on their own. Cause it's so difficult, this D to C shipping industry. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, uh, I was on a podcast earlier this year and, uh, and, and, uh, the host said to me, he said, wait, so you don't actually raise the animals. He's like, but you sell them. He's like, well, that's messed up. And I'm like, no, the people who are really good at raising, <laughs> like, like they need to focus on what they're, what they're really good at. And that's, that's raising the animals. Yeah. Um, and, um, I mean, no disrespect by this at all, but like, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's two different, I mean, it's just two different, two different lanes. Like, and, uh, you know, the, just because you're really good at, at, at raising and growing, like, like the, the other side of it is very hard. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's very hard. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it takes, it takes both, um, um, back in, you know, there was, there was, yeah, there, there was a time where you, you could just, you could raise and sell to the village, but yeah, that's just not the, it's not the day and age that we live in, um, today. So we're, yeah, our, our mission is to connect the American, uh, family to the American farm. And, um, and we, yeah, we're, we're very proud to be able to do that. We're very okay. proud. Um, you know, I, I say, say in jest with like companies like butcher box, um, and, um, you know, uh, but the, I, I used to shy away from even like saying their name or, um, talking about, you know, different things, but, um, they're going to do about six, anywhere from 500 to $600 million in revenue, wow. Wow. um, this year. Again, that's, uh, their, their CEO went on a podcast recently or, um, um, talking talking about that, like he's, you know, their, their numbers. And, um, that's a lot. Yeah. Like that's a lot. And, uh, that's a lot of imported beef that they're selling because per their website, we source the majority of their, uh, the majority of our beef from Australia. Again, not that it's wrong, but they should have to, they should, they should have to say that. Mm -hmm. Um, like they, they should just have to say that that's all I'm, that's all we're saying is you should have to be transparent with it. I'm not saying that, um, I mean, frankly, like there's a, there is some play, there are, there's a place for imported beef. Yeah. Um, like, like a a lot of your fast food restaurants, like I mean, actually all your fast food restaurants, like they're, they're, they're selling imported beef. Um, and they need to be able to keep price is low. Cause there's, there are some people that that's what, that's all they can afford. They can't afford to go to a steakhouse. They can't afford to like, um, uh, to buy, to buy those things. So, um, you, you know, there's places for it, but it's to what you said earlier, it's sad that whole foods can import low quality beef and sell it at a premium. Mm-hmm. Like, like they're, it's so overvalued and people think, Oh, I'm shopping at, at Whole Foods, so like, and uh, and the reality is like, um, all this imported stuff you can, I could I could purchase it, um, the stuff that sells for the the highest amount at Whole Foods, the stuff that Butcher Box is selling and yeah. getting a premium for and and marketing it as such, I could buy that cheaper than. I could buy USDA select, which mm. is the lowest grade at the grocery store, which we don't sell any USDA. We don't even source any USDA select, Yeah, but I could buy the highest end imported meat for cheaper than I could buy USDA select. Wow. Yeah. And the pe- highest end imported beef is still cheaper than USDA select. Yes. That's incredible. I didn't know that. Did you yeah. know that? No. Yeah. It's, it's, that's how, and that's just how inferior <laughs> it, it is like it's uh you know and like and again like it's, it's being mass produced like in i mean i don't know if i'm sure i'm sure you guys have talked about it but like in brazil i mean they're they're mowing down the rainforest yeah. to make more space for cattle um because they've realized that it's literally a cash cow mm. um 
I guess that's where the phrase came from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's interesting, you said your your um, you know, what you guys are going for is connecting the family to the farm, the American family to the American farmer, and I don't think a lot of people really take the time to think about the disconnect that has happened over the past several decades, where we used to know our f- farmer, mm-hmm. like my grandparents. Uh, knew where they were getting their food from and who, yeah. which family was providing it for them. Uh, that disconnect has really been the main driver in terms of all these bad health outcomes that we see today from a big picture perspective because your attention goes where your dollar goes. And if you really like spend the time with the people who are actually putting the effort in to make your food, you understand what they're doing, you make more informed decisions. So I think that the mission that you guys are really trying to, uh, navigate w- with your companies is incredible. Um, and I just wonder, do you think the American consumer really understands that disconnect and that, that how bad, um, it really is? Yeah. Most don't, I don't, I don't think so. Most don't again, because we're so far removed. I mean, gosh, most like most people have never even come close to a, a, a working farm or mm. ranch like so we're just so yeah. far removed we think that um like we we think that like there's this factory with smoke coming out and a cow comes in like yeah and, and that cow didn't even wasn't even raised it's just like just it's just it just is <laughs> this yeah. full-size cow and it goes in and it comes out a hamburger like that's yeah. like we just think and you know we're, we're in this microwave society and we i mean you can go on Amazon and like a lot of things you can even order and get them same day, get it. Yeah. Get it same day. Some things you can get within an hour or two. Yeah. It's, it's getting crazy. And so, um, that's like, you know, we're in this microwave society. We have been for uh, decades now, like, um, multiple Generation. generations yeah. now. So yeah, we, um, yeah, we're very far removed. The, the, the consumer is very far removed from, the, the reality, and like I said earlier, the humanity of the farmer and the rancher and the people who are working for months and years raising these animals um, so that they can have food. And, um, yeah, it, yeah, I mean, you said it, like, it's, it's really not going to be a, but it's going to be a combination of a lot of things, though. It, it takes yeah. the Netflix documentaries, it takes the podcasts like this and others, and um, and it, it takes companies like us and it takes, and it's going to take more uh, yeah. than, than, than just us. And, um, you know, we're, we're not the only ones, uh, we're, we're not the only people out, out here, you know, so coming from a ministry background, um, um, I, I relate a lot of things to stories in the Bible, but there was a prophet in the old Testament who was like crying out to God, I'm the only prophet. And God was like, actually, you're not, I've got you know, hundreds of others just like you. Um, you know, the last thing I want to put out there is that we're the only ones doing things right. There, yeah. you know, there's um, there are other people out there working just as hard, um, maybe even harder, like um, trying to promote this message, do the right thing. Um, and um, and and I tell everybody, like, if you know a farmer, buy from the farmer. Yeah. Like if you if you if you if you know a farmer, if you um, and that lives in your area or, and you have access to buy from them, support them. Like that's, that's what we need. We need people being intentional to, 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 I want to support farmers. I want to support ranchers. I want to support local. I want to support my community. I want to support my neighborhood. I want to yeah. support my, my, my state, my country. Like, yeah. like just, just do something, um, besides the, you know, the easiest, convenient thing um of well i'm just gonna go to the grocery store and buy whatever's on sale like yeah should be you know again there's checks and balances to everything but it starts with just starts with just making some sort of decision of hey what can i do to help this some and and if we all work a little um i think that the difference could be big. Yeah. You have the opposite of a zero sum mentality where you're actively encouraging customers. Like, no, if you don't want to order from us, like if you found a local farm, 
That's amazing. I'm sure that there are a bunch of your customers where you're like the gateway drug to get them into like the grass finish, like the local farming meat space. And then maybe eventually they do more digging and they find their own ranch and you, you proudly support that. And I think to Harry's point, it's your point. I think it's a very simple answer to your question of, I mean, 99% of Americans have never met their local farmer. Mm -hmm. So being that intentional to actually go out there, that's really what you need to do. And, and you, you brought up a good point. Podcasts, documentaries, it's a great bridge product in some ways, but nothing will ever replicate just going out there for yourself, seeing things, ask the right questions. And for us, it's like, I'll proudly spend a large portion of my salary on really good nutrient dense food from a farmer. It almost feels like a sacred transaction in some ways of like, like you said, knowing how hard this rancher actually worked to provide me this meat. And then now I have an obligation to nourish myself, cook meals for my family, friends. It's like the, it's the best feeling. Mm -hmm. No, it's, that's a hundred percent accurate. And, um, yeah, you know, the reality is it usually does cost a little more. Yeah. Like, like we're, um, and, um, there's so much division in just our world period, but, uh, and it's just what we do is we, we divide, but, um, we try our best to not be to to be pro meat mm-hmm. like we're pro meat yeah first and foremost like um you know you can start getting granular on a lot of different things but at the end of the day humans we should be eating meat mm-hmm. like it's good for you yes. um now there is definitely right ways to raise it wrong ways to raise it but um but at the end of the day eating meat is still better than not eating meat. Definitely. Like, um, and if, and so buy the things that you can afford, but I would encourage everyone to like what you just said, I would encourage everyone to go, okay, well, let me just prioritize though a little bit, my own body, my own life. And, um, it's, I really shouldn't be buying the cheapest. If let me, maybe yeah. sacrifice somewhere else because what I put into my body is actually very important yes. and I'm going to get the biggest return long-term over what I put into my body. So um, there does need to be a mind shift of prioritizing the importance of nutrient dense and uh, food and, um, and food that is um, ultimately going to sustain you, make like, like add to your quality of life. Yes. Um, and it's the mentality though, for so long has just been what's the cheapest, what's the cheapest. That's what yes. the grocery store promotes, you know, a H E B, which, um, or Kroger or wherever, you know, I, I can't think of many others cause I live in Texas, but, yeah. um, <laughs> but you know, the grocery store, their whole mentality is like cheap meat, cheap meat, cheap meat, cheap mm-hmm. meat. Like, and you know, we have to compete with that because people are like, Oh, I can get, you know, people are still on pre-COVID meat prices, even though they don't exist. You know, they're like, oh, I can get ribeyes for four ninety nine a pound. Like, you know, I can get ground set, ground beef for 99 cents. Like, first of all, you, there's, it's not, it's like, it's, yeah. we're way past those prices. Um, but it's, it's more important and it's bigger. Like meat is more, it's, it's, it's not just about like how cheap you can get it. Like quality really matters. Remember, you're eating this, you're putting it into your body. Um, so quality really matters. But even beyond that, it's what are you supporting? Like, you know, what are you doing for your own health? That's like first. But then beyond that is who are you supporting when you buy that yeah. at the grocery store? Like, like or, or, you know, from online, like, um, who are you supporting? Who are you helping? And if you can spend a little bit more to feel better about what you eat, like actually physically, and then also feel better about what, where you're buying from, because you know, you're supporting good causes, you know, you're supporting, um, local, geez, you should do that. Yeah. Is there anything that you learned during your time in ministry that you're applying to what you're doing at Good Ranchers? Cause I feel like what you're doing is, is as Brett said earlier, incredibly noble, but also just it feels like God's work where there's just so many factors pushing against this trend of 
American grown beef. It's higher, higher prices. Quality is, is higher, but it's getting undercut. It's just um, very uh, noble mission. So curious if you, if you uh, see any parallels there. Yeah, um, I do. Uh, and like the, it's a couple of things. The first and foremost, it's do the right thing. Yeah, <laughs> do the right thing because it's the right thing, not like like uh, uh, what's the the line? Uh, 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 reputation um, is what people see, but character. Like, reputation is what you do that people see. Character is what you do that people don't see. Mm. So. Um, uh, things I learned in ministry is what are the things that you do that people don't see? Um, and, uh, and, and that was really the heart of who we were at Good Ranchers. Like when I said we drew a line in the sand, like, um, and decided to source quality and to mm. source things that only our family, like that I'm going to eat and feed to my wife and my kids and my friends and my family. Um, like we made that decision because it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, we, we, and we, we, we never even considered, well, maybe we could have two lines. Maybe we can have a, yeah. a value line. Like we're like, no, like it, it's important. Um, so, so yeah, so the, the, the character side of just who we are as a company, I think that was established in me through the years of, of ministry. Um, and then I, I would say, so, um, you know, we connect the American family to the American farm. Um, but, um, internally what we, what we talk about in, in our company and to our, our staff and our employees is we bring people to the table. Mm. anybody can just put meat in a box like but food is a fundamental human need that um you need it you need it literally to sustain life you yeah. need water you need air you need food um you can you, you're gonna die without it it's fundamental so um but right past that um it's also fundamentally important that we have community and mm. we have relationship and we have um, connection with each other. And if COVID taught us anything, it's, it's how um, detrimental isolation is yes. and being separated and not having community. Mm. And um, so what I love about food, what I love about a good meal, um, especially uh, let's just use steak, even though it can be anything, but you know, like you can, um, you fire up the grill and you invite people over and like there's a communal part around food. Um, even when you go through the Bible, it's like, you know, like if they're going to have a party, they get the fatted calf mm -hmm. and you, you know, you, 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 food brings people together. And, uh, and I think all the way even to, um, the last supper with Jesus, um, it's a group of people as the disciples and Jesus. And it's just this group sitting around a table, sharing a meal. Definitely. And that's what communion is. Like we make this ritual of, of cracker and juice, um, uh, that happens in church. But, but what Jesus was actually saying is, Hey, when you gather around the table, when you gather with the bread, when you gather with the wine, when you gather, um, um, at the table, do it in remembrance of me remember me mm. when you like, and he symbolized the bread's my body and the, 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 the wine is my blood. Mm. Um, but all he was saying is when you gather, remember me, Yeah, let me be the center. And so understanding the power that food brings people together. What do you do on a first date? Typically you, you, know. you go, yeah. Like, Hey, go to go out to eat. Like, um, you want to like, meet a new friend, meet, so like, yeah. uh, like food brings people together. Um, you have a party at your house, you don't have food, people aren't coming back. Like you have <laughs> a party at your house, you're having food, you're grilling, you're getting like, it's just this thing that brings people together. So for us, we like to say anybody can put meat in a box. There's lots of people putting meat in a box, but we, um, you know, we have a, a really strong culture with our staff because, um, they, they, they know that our mission is more than just putting meat in a box, that 
we're about bringing people to the table. We're about bringing people together about like what that food does. And the reality that hit me, gosh, maybe a couple of years ago when someone posted on Instagram that it was their 25th wedding anniversary and they were celebrate, like they were, they cooked one of our steaks. Mm. And I thought, dude, that's a very intimate part of someone's life that we yes. have a part of. And we better be like, we better be sending them something that they actually like and yeah. enjoy and, and go like, um, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a intimate part in someone's home, the dinner table. And, um, so, you know, we're honored to be able to provide that for, um, a lot of families and mm. we want to continue to do it. And, um, I don't know if I completely answered your question the right way, but you know, as far as like ministry background, those are the things that are important um, to me. That was an amazing answer. And the Bible does mention meat 274 times. I checked before this podcast. There that's it is. a pretty cool little nugget. Okay. Um, ben, we're so appreciative of you doing this episode. Unfortunately, we're getting kicked out of the studio. We need, yeah. we honestly need way more time with you. So part two, okay. maybe in Houston, <laughs> we'll come out to visit you. I think oh, that'd, that'd be, be awesome. really cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, really quick. What's the best way for people to connect with you and the Good Ranchers team if they want to order some meat? Yeah. Goodranchers.com. Yeah. It's just, uh, our website. Um, it's pretty plain and simple. We're, we are working diligently to be able to have more customization. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're still, again, so f- we are a family business and we're growing as fast as we can yeah. and, you know, getting the technology uh, there as fast as we can. Um, but uh, we have lots of pre-configured options and pretty much anything that, that you would want. Um, we just, uh, we were just released a fully uh, wild caught seafood that we're super excited about. Nice. Um, so yeah, um, as of now we have all animal proteins, beef, chicken, seafood, and pork. And it's all on goodranchers.com. Let's go. Awesome. Well, yeah. we appreciate it, Ben. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank keep, you guys. Keep fighting the good fight. Yeah, for real. Thanks.